Hello and welcome to another episode of the Trip of a Lifetime podcast with me, Celeste. And me, Jasmine. Today we're talking about Dalek. Um, it aired on the 30th of April 2005. It was written by Robert Shearman and directed by Joe Ahern. I don't believe Robert Shearman has actually written another Doctor Who episode since then, but he has done stuff for Big Finish. And in fact, this episode is actually inspired by a Big Finish drama written by him called Jubilee, which I think featured the sixth Doctor. I've not listened to it. Um, it's not like identical or anything, like there are lots of differences, but I'm assuming it focuses on one lone Dalek who maybe becomes more sympathetic. I'm not entirely sure. I'm assuming the Dalek is called Jubilee, or maybe it's set during a Jubilee, I'm not entirely sure. I don't know. Before we start, I have a question that is relevant. Sure. What day is the the silence will fall day where you write um tally marks on your hands? I think it's like the twenty fifth of April. Why? Yeah. I know it's set I... in the same year. It's both two thousand twelve. But why? And in Utah. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. Anyway. So would that mean that? Amy and Rory and that without spoiling, sorry. Uh Amy and Rory and the eleventh doctor, etc. would be in the same obviously not in the same place, but in the same time, potentially. I mean, do they actually say the date in this episode? No, I don't think they do. No. Um <laughs> I don't know, it's reasonable to suggest that they are roughly near each other, but this could easily be happening. In January or December, like we don't know, because they're literally underground the entire time. But I just love it how they're walking through the muse- the museum, and I'm sure a lot of the props in the cases are stuff that they'll use in other episodes, and they're just reusing stuff. Like you get, you see the Slovene arm. Um, you also get to see like a classic Cyberman head design. I guess Van Staten. I mean, I remember reading in the writer's tale that Russell says that when when writing one-off characters, it's best to stick with stereotypes, or at least like a model, like a type of character that people are going to recognise, because that's how you connect with characters and you work out what type of ca- a character they are very quickly, and it allows the audiences to connect with them a lot quicker, because you want to kind of keep most of the character development for the main characters and not the side characters. Obviously they can have a small arc during the actual episode. They can change for better or for worse. But and Van Satin is very much a uh, stereotypical billionaire, awful person, doesn't care about anyone else. They're all dispendable, um, expendable, I'm amazing kind of thing. I was going to say disposable and or expendable and ended up merging the two together. <laughs> anyway, what do you think? I, I, I completely agree with you regarding that. And I have another annoying question. Okay. So, so you know this, this is set in the same year as like the Matt Smith era, like I keep talking about. Uh, so he says that, that this is the last Dalek. I think he says that anyway. I don't know if he means the last living Dalek or the last Dalek style thing on Earth. But in a... I don't know, actually, because of the plot to this. Okay, I'm going to cut you um, yeah, okay, I'm gonna cut you good. off, right? I get what you mean. You mean that, you know, this is the last... The Doctor saying this is the last Dalek ever in existence. And then later on, even earlier than this, there's actually more Daleks. But at that point, I, get, I, I, I don't know, it's it's hard to say. I guess you could read it as a plot hole, but also you could read it as... I mean, what I will say is, obviously, Russell and co. and Robert Shearman and everyone else didn't know what they were going to write in the future, necessarily, because they didn't have the whole era planned out at that point. Well, or ever, actually. A lot of it was made up on the spot. But and also a lot of the Daleks they literally get defeated almost straight away anyway, so they are technically dead by that point. You know, I think it's mainly because the Doctors know better, and technically all the Daleks from the Time War 
were dead. I mean, especially if you operate from the time can be rewritten rule. We're sure at the moment this is the only Dalek that's still alive, but then time gets rewritten from the Doctor's point of view after this. So that's what I'm going to say. Okay. Did that answer your question? Yes, it did. Cool, 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 cool. Now let's talk about Adam. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, I, he's, I think he's supposed to be unlikable, but not so unlikable that you hate him. Or at least not yet, anyway. Um, we'll get to that. Like, he is set up to be quite a selfish character. He's also very arrogant. You know, like, when he meets Rose, he's trying to show off constantly, and he's going on about how much of a genius he is. And I'm like, oh my god. But then I think the reason why Rose starts to like him so much, so quickly, is A, okay, he's young and attractive. Or relatively attractive. Uh, B, you know, he's somewhat of a genius. And C, he uses the word fantastic when he gets excited about something. Now... Who do you think Rose is? Uh, ha, this is basically just Rose projecting her feelings for the Doctor onto someone she views as slightly more attainable at this point. Like, you know, I think she's very much, maybe not in denial, she's definitely you knows she's attracted to the Doctor, but I think she kind of ignores it, thinking, oh, he's a lot older than me because she knows he's 900 and something at this point. And, you know, I'm technically still with Mickey, although she seems to keep forgetting that. Like, even when he's there, she's kind of like, oh, I don't really want to kiss you, but I will, because technically we're still together. Um, I feel, part of me feels so sorry for Mickey, but part of me keeps, you know, visualising the actor who plays him and going, oh, you know what I mean? <laughs> also, saying that, the actor who plays um, uh, Adam, Bruno Langley, is well, not as bad as the other guy, but he isn't great. He has had some... he's been arrested a few times. Uh, he has been, uh, oh god, what's the phrase? Uh, accused of sexual assault and things. So, you know, Rose isn't really having much luck other than the Doctor with love interests. But anyway, um, yeah, I guess he's, you know, he's annoying. But he's somewhat intelligent, and that intelligence does bring him down next episode. But we'll obviously get to that next time. Yeah, what do you think about him? He's okay. I thought he was a lot better in this episode than he was in the next, uh, in terms of character. But at the same time, I didn't really like him as much as other characters, like who are only in one, ep one or two episodes. But I didn't think he was that bad, and I didn't think he was as greedy as he is in the next episode. Yeah, we'll get to that um, and get to why I think Russell included, or why Russell opted to bring him into the next episode, because he could have just left him behind with all the other characters, but he didn't. And that is, for, I think, for a specific reason. Yeah, I, I, it's interesting how the Doctor kind of acts in this episode, because he get. I think this is arguably the darkest the Doctor gets this particular season. Um, like, he is properly angry and upset and all of these emotions that he's kind of been buffing up due to the time war have just come straight to the forefront and he's kind of losing it. Uh, I was going to say, for a split second, other than these darker emotions and feelings like anger and like revenge, right, for a split second you can actually see the Doctor scared, which is the second he sees the, the uh, Dalek. But then after he's realised that it can't harm him, he has this smug expression on his face. Yeah, it's very much that kind of power that he now has the power over this Dalek and he's going to start taunting um, it because, you know, he holds all the cards. This Dalek is vulnerable. Um, or as vulnerable as it can be. Yeah, the thing I was going to say is apparently that big speech that he gives to the Dalek in that room wasn't supposed to be delivered in that manner. It was supposed to be a lot calmer. Um, but apparently Chris Ruxton wanted to go a lot darker against the director's wishes and the director was actually like uh, was like, oh actually that's not that's actually pretty good. I also really like when the doctor called uh, the Dalek a space bin. A space dust bin. And a pepper pot, I think that's also mentioned. Like those are like the two big things that people have 
uh, like in the darks too, and I think you know Russell's not snuck both of them in as a joke. It's interesting how once Rose touches the Dalek and he uses this like the time travel energy, the Ultron energy, to kind of regenerate itself back to being new, brand new, um, and then kind of gets all the information from the internet and then starts going on the rampage, right? But how this Dalek, not only is it a hell of a lot more scary and a hell of a lot more sinister than the big hordes of Daleks you see later on, because again, it plays on those conventions of a, of a slasher film, where you've got one thing chasing after you, um, which is much more terrifying, but also it uses its brain to outwit its opponents, because I think sometimes the Daleks are a bit of a joke later on, and also in Classic Who, where, you know, the Daleks seem a bit dim, whereas this Dalek literally, by, you know, uses the, uh, sets off the fire alarm to cause the sprinklers to go, and uses the water to electrocute a huge load of people. Like, that's clever, and the, no Dalek has ever done that since then, it's all just firing at people. But maybe it's because, I'm not calling Daleks dumb here, but maybe it's because he, uh, the Dalek absorbed Rose's DNA, which also gave him the um, ability of empathy. But it also might have given him the ability to problem solve. Yeah, but I, I'd argue that the Daleks should theoretically be able to problem solve anyway. <laughs> no, I, I think they should be able to, but... Because, um, you know, a Dalek sec manages to problem solve and ends uh, in evolution... Is it Evolution of the Daleks? Dalek Statement about an Evolution of the Daleks? And that ends up backfiring on him majorly. But obviously we'll not get into that. So I, I think it is that the Daleks are capable of that. But I, maybe it's because there's only one Dalek. And therefore, because there's only one of them, they have to be a bit more... I don't know. They have to take the initiative a bit more. Because when you have, like... I don't know. When there's only one of you you can't cover as much ground, whereas when there's, like, you know, the massive hordes, you know, they can all just start firing and they don't have to worry about that. Maybe it's just efficiency, I think. Maybe that must be what it comes down to, efficiency. Um, but I, I mean, I both love and simultaneously hate the fact that they made a Dalek sympathetic. You know, I, like, because Daleks, you know, when they were originally created, were literally an allegory for Nazis. You know, that's the way that they, um, you know, could do t tell those kind of stories using, you know, aliens, um, because otherwise they would have probably get gotten um, accused of being too political, um, especially back in you know the sixties. So that that's what they're there for. So obviously, you you know, Nazis they're awful people, right? So you don't you, you don't expect yourself to sympathise with them. Whereas, I guess, because as Dalek starts mutating and starts changing their mind and starts becoming a better person, I guess maybe it's continuing that narrative that anyone can become better. Anyone can improve themselves. That doesn't, you know, negate what they've done. You know, obviously you've still got to acknowledge all the terrible things they've done already, but you they can change and at least, you know, improve their behaviour so they don't do it again. Obviously that Dalek, you know, they're full of hatred. And that's not acceptable, so that's why he and the Dalek builds up killing himself. It's it's really dark, considering this is a this is a family show. Like, cause my I was talking to my mum about what I'd do if I was Doctor Shudder in there, and she was like, "Did you realise that kids would be watching this?" And I'm like, sitting here like this is not even half as awful as some of these. Like, I'm just talking about killing off a character, not this. Like, uh, what I was gonna say is, um. Some of the characters, so you have this scene where Rose, uh, Adam, and I don't know what her name is. Oh, the guard lady. Yeah. Who just calls, uh, just call her the guard lady. Guard I don't lady. Know. Okay, where they're That's running right. up the stairs, and then they're like, ha, the Dalek can't come up the stairs. But then you can see in their face, that, and you also feel, oh yeah, they're safe, you know, the Daleks can't go upstairs. Until the second that the Daleks start elevating, and then you're like, oh no. Well, yeah, that's because in Classic Who, Daleks couldn't go upstairs, and it was a massive joke that, you know, these big, powerful kind of war machines just get defeated by stairs. So I guess I think Russell just used this 
as, as, an, as an episode sure to make the Daleks more menacing than they have been for, uh, before you know it got cancelled but also so that he could make as many references and jokes as he possibly could about the Daleks at the same time and I suppose you know bring the Daleks properly into the 21st century with this extra technology and the CGI that they could use to properly make the Daleks fight because originally the reason why the Daleks couldn't go upstairs is because the props they were using physical, purely using physical props, they didn't have the CGI because they barely had the budget to make good costumes, let alone anything else, so it's true, I mean like, have you looked, seen the picture that had been going around um, because of the Legend of the Sea Devils of the original Merkur costume from the episode it's basically, you can see the painted green bubble wrap and it's stuck <laughs> and just in fabric like it is awful but apparently that has been credited as a fifth doctor story and that one out of, like monster has been credited as part of the reason why doctor Who got cancelled like about 10 years after that um true tr- true story um but i guess the other thing i really like is when van staten the doctor and his assist uh, van staten's assistant who I can't remember the name of are in that bunker and they haven't closed the doors yet, but Van Staten's telling them to stop firing because he doesn't want the dark to get destroyed. And they don't, and then you can hear slowly, one by one, each a gun stops firing, right? And that's not because they're stopping willingly, that's because they're all getting killed. And it's quite chilling to hear that. Um, because they didn't need to show it, they didn't need to, you know, tell us that they're all dead. They just used sound. Because often, I suppose, sound is the one thing in media that's often overlooked by even people that actually work in the business. Like, I remember when we started college, we did a... We've just finished it now. We're doing a filmmaking course, like, it's practical. And the one thing I think everyone in our course completely underestimated is how difficult sound design is. It's so hard. Um, Yeah, and you have to put tons of thought into it. You have to start thinking about sound design almost before you start thinking about everything else. It sounds a bit like an oxymoron, because you think, well, surely you need a story first. Like, well, yeah, you do. But also, you should know how we're all going to, you know, make it sound good, you know? So I was going to say uh, that um, there's this theme... Well, it's not a theme. It's pretty much throughout the whole thing. But the Doctor... There's a scene where the Doctor thinks Rose is dead, or is, and you can literally see him really upset and about to, like not cry but just really upset and just kind of like really this has happened and then you can see this like switch go off in his head where he's just gone into the darker mode where he's like i'm gonna avenge you you know that kind of mode and then he starts snapping at everyone yeah definitely i mean the doctor i mean every incarnation has that um some more than others i think i guess 11 i think Definitely. has it i think the switch is more present in both 10 and 11 more than it is in the others because capaldi there's always that edge and the same with eccleston like you you see that darkness even when they're at their most at that with and in their light moments whereas i guess smith changes almost immediately and tenant just starts shouting quite quite actually a lot quicker than you think he would start shouting he's, he's like it seems like shouting is his default setting at times in some of his episodes yeah and then i guess when you see uh, it's interesting it, literally a couple of seconds after that when it's revealed that rose is still alive i mean obviously you can see that the dalek is confused as to why he can't kill her and once he realizes he can't kill her he now can't kill anyone else but then you know he's pointing the blaster at rose and it's kind of like, well, you know, I, I'm going to kill the woman you love unless you open the door. And it's literally at that point, you know, it's canonical fact. Because the Doctor doesn't go, oh, I'm not in love with her. He just doesn't say anything. He opens the door, in fact. He's like, well, I'm not, I've lost her once, I'm not losing her again, you know what I mean? So again, I, I maintain the fact that last episode, you can literally see the moment he falls in love with her. And what did you think about, I mean, there's not too much CGI in this. There was a bit, there was one bit that I found really dodgy, I'm not sure if you 
noticed it that even the bullets like got stopped by the Dalek in like that casing, that kind of like force field thing. Do you remember that? Yes, but I did that. I did like that. Oh, you did. I <laughs> thought it was. I was sorry. It took me out of it a bit because I think they do it a lot better in Stolen Earth Journey's End. Maybe because I guess you know they've got more practice at it. it. By that point, it's three seasons. You're about four years later. Well, actually, three years later, but you know what I mean. Uh, I found that really jarring, but I guess, you know, that's my personal opinion. I also really like the extermination CGI with all the light, and it was really, I really liked that, or the electrocutions, I should say. Yeah, apparently that's very expensive, which is why they try not to do it too much in one episode. Um, a lot of time they'll rely on sound or cutting away instead. Um, but it is a cool effect, and they use that quite a lot throughout New Who. I think they're still using that kind of effect even in the Whitaker, I believe. Yeah, I think so. I think they did use it in um, Eve of the Daleks, which is the most recent Dalek episode as of recording. Um, is that everything? That's everything I've got. Okay, what? so what would you rate this? I would rate this a 5.5 out of 10. Y you joking? I'm not. 5.5? 5. 5. Yeah. My god. <laughs> Jasmine, you're going to get this. So many people are going to disagree with that because it is known as one of the best Doctor episodes in the sense that of what it does with the Doctor's character development and the Dalek itself and the actual plot line and story. And I actually gave it a 9 out of 10. I loved it. It was great. Because I, I guess, maybe because you're looking at still a visual standpoint, whereas, you know, you kind of got, I don't know, I'm looking at it theme-wise. And I have a feeling we're probably going to disagree over the next episode as well. Although I have to, uh, we'll get back to that more next episode when we talk about the long game. But actually, I changed my mind quite a lot about that last episode, because I used to think it was worse than it actually is. Anyway, I think that's all we've what? I'm just going to explain why I rated it 5.5 out of 10. Okay. So, personally, I just don't like it vibe-wise. I think the character development or the character depth is really good with the Doctor. And I did like the whole um, empathy part and how you can literally see the Doctor change from one emotion to the next when he thinks Rose is dead and the next second she's alive and how he treats others because of that. But I just didn't like it from a plot point point of view. And I just, it wasn't one that I could really get immersed in compar comparatively to other ones. But I guess, it, do you like prefer more of the fun episodes? I think so. Yeah, maybe this is what, I mean, I do like some of the fun episodes, but maybe this is where I differ because I do quite like it when the Doctor goes dark, basically. When the Doctor becomes darker is when I have the most fun in you know, an episode, I think. Um, yeah, I get what you mean. I, I kind of, I, I do, I, I guess not everyone's going to love it, but I do think it is one of the best in this series. If not, I'm not sure whether it would make the top 10. It might be like number 9 or 10 out of like a top 10 episode, but it might not quite squeeze in there, but it is definitely up there. It would definitely make my top 20. Yeah, anyway, so that's all we've got time for for today and i hope you'll join us next time when we talk about the long game um yeah see you soon